Now it happened, as he went in to the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering, spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. Now look, if you have your Bibles, please turn to that portion we read together, Luke chapter 14, verses 1 to 6, where the Lord Jesus has been invited uh, to a house of the ruler of the Pharisees. And what we find here is this, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is dynamite uh, to religion. Uh, on many levels, in every area and section of this world, the challenge of Jesus Christ and the gospel is the greatest challenge that the world faces. I mean, even if you are an atheist and people, you know, say, I don't believe in God, I could give you this day many arguments of why you need to believe in God, but the best and the greatest argument would be Jesus Christ. Explain Jesus Christ. How do you explain this person, this life, all that's been revealed uh, to us? Uh, But most of all, the Lord Jesus Christ is a problem not really to atheists, but to religious people. And this world, remember now, is filled with religion. Whatever else may be going on uh, by the news and the science, at the end of the day, This world on every continent is saturated with religion. Some form of religion, some belief, some uh, rituals that people have. We're we're dealing with something like, you know, it's 99%, you know, and even more 0.9 would be having some religious faith. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes into this world, there is a great conflict challenge that he brings to people whose lives are taken up with the practice, the regulations, the rituals, the beliefs, the works of piety, the pilgrimages, the acts of religious devotion. The Lord Jesus Christ, you see, comes and it is a massive confrontation to what he's come to bring and what exists in this world even to the most orthodox, even to the most uh, God-believing, what Jesus Christ does when he has entered this world exposes, even with the best of those leaders which we have here, of the Pharisees. He exposes their religion, their tradition, their attitudes and customs which are so contrary to the things then of God. Now, when people say to you, there are many ways to God, you can say, no, there's only one, Jesus Christ. When people say to you, let's put Jesus Christ on a kind of uh, comparison, or even on a pedestal, really, with all the religions of the world, and we all get on nice together, that's the kind of thing we've got this day, isn't it? That we need now to just all be part. When you find the message of Jesus Christ, They are utterly, remember, religion is opposed to him. What he's come to do is to save people from their religion. And what you find here in these very verses then this morning is that we've got an insight really once again to one of these conflict passages which we find. And uh, it's really interesting that the Lord Jesus here is invited, it happened, He went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees. And when you think of all the trouble he's had, 
in the house of the rulers of the Pharisees. This is not the first time, is it, that we find him many times. For example, in chapter 11, verse 37, and as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to eat. Now, here's something for you to understand. Do you know that people can invite Jesus Christ into their homes? It's a good thing to do. Invite the Lord Jesus Christ into your home, but not invite him into the heart. And so it is what you've got here. Many times Jesus went to the home of such people. And what then he, he comes, we see the contrast. Now, this is an interesting portion because it's only found in Luke's Gospel. And one of the reasons it's found in Luke's Gospel, I'll just give you a human reason, is as you know, there was uh, Luke, the doctor. He was one who was the, he had uh, doctored experience. He was one who cared for the infirmities of people. And now you've got a situation where a man now is found here in the house, We'll describe it to you after the reason why he's here. He's got what's called here the dropsy. The dropsy. Um, that means he had a, a, a fluid retention where he was uh, bloated up out of proportion. Uh, there was a distortion. There was something obviously happening in his body which wasn't good which meant that he was now one which was filled with a fluid. Um, that was something that perhaps Luke was interested in. What you need to know something about this situation is, if you took him to A&E on uh, any day of the week, and you put him in that ward or in A&E, he'd be waiting for days. They, they would look out and they would think, well, who do we need to call next? Well, the man with the dropsy would not be number one on the target. It's because, you see, although he was ill, it wasn't that he was going to die that very moment. And yet what we find here in the, in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and every miracle reveals something about Jesus, reveals something about his ministry. When you come to this miracle, it's a bit different because this is now, we believe, a setup. A setup. He's been now invited into this house, and so it is. They watch him closely. And verse 2 And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And all we can think of is this is that perhaps that he was placed there. Because normally, People like this would not be found in the house of such people. But there was a reason for it. Now remember what we are told here in verse 1. That they watched him closely. Now, now you find that again. For example, in that chapter 11, remember what happened last time. It, didn't ha it doesn't go good. He's invited to the house and in verse 38... And when the Pharisees saw it, they marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And if you remember how that dinner party went, well, that went down, did it? Like a lead balloon. Because in that very situation, the Lord Jesus Christ ended up from the very beginning. Didn't wash his hands. They watched him and he has something to say to them. You're concerned with a minor and not the major. You're concerned with the outward, not the inward. You're concerned, he begins to tell them, not so much with the spiritual and the things of God, and he calls them. You're like whitewashed sepulchres. He began to tell them what they were really like. Can you imagine that dinner party? So here we go again. He's invited into the house. I don't, I don't want you to do it, uh, but if you ever watch cage fighting, that's what you've got here. You've got now in this confine of another house, the conflict that the Lord Jesus Christ finds himself in. And uh, I think I may have told you, please understand what's taking place. 
This is the gospel. This is Jesus Christ, God's good news, who's come into this world. And if you want to know where Jesus Christ came, he came into a world which was not for him, not with him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And when the Lord Jesus Christ did his work, always remember this. He was never playing at home. Never playing at home. He was always playing on the away ground. He was always fighting in someone else's backyard. He was always in conflict with no supporters or cheerers around him. When Jesus Christ came in and did his work, when you think of what we see this day, you may have been watching the World Cup rugby and you've seen France and how they came and they, they beat uh, New Zealand. And what a match it was. And of course, they had the crowds around them, cheering them on, egging them on. And everybody knows if you've ever played sport, there is home and away. If you follow the football, there's 38 matches a, a season. You play one game home, one game away. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, always played away. And he was always found in such tension and conflict. And people out to set him up and to get him and to bring him down. And uh, you need to ask the question. There's many things I could tell you about this passage. There's questions that people have about why the Lord Jesus Christ did such things. I tell you why he did such things. Because he knew that although these people were against him, he loved them, wanted to reach them, knew they were lost in a big way, had a heart of mercy for them. And he used to enter in to the lion's den. That's what he did. Now, I, I know there are certain things I need to teach you from this today. But I, I do need to just put a break on something. Because you need to be careful. We're told to pray. Lead us not in to temptation. Deliver us from evil. And there are certain things that Jesus Christ could do that you and me can simply not do. And when it comes to uh, such occasions as this, the Lord Jesus Christ was walking in to one of these situations. You know what's happened in the past. I'm sure you've been in that place where, you know, someone has turned on you, someone has uh, come against you, and, and then as soon as that happens, you're on your guard, you're weary. You make sure that you, you put in uh, little steps, that you don't get caught once again. The Lord Jesus knew all that. He is all wise. He's all good. He understands it all. But you see, such is the Lord Jesus. He is like one you see who goes in. And when you read it here, can you imagine what it's like? It says, uh, he went to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. You could cut the atmosphere with a knife. The tension must have been uh, something indeed. Now, I'm going to say to you, I, I don't know uh, what, what to do in various circumstances. All I know is this, that the Lord Jesus took every invitation he had, even though they were hostile. Do you remember that? Just think of that. People are hostile. People against the Lord Jesus. People who want to question him, scrutinize him. People who've got objections to him. People who are not for him. You may not be for him. You may have objections to him, but I can tell you this. You invite him, and he'll come. He'll come. And every objection, every scrutiny, he'll come and he'll place himself under every doubt and perplexity and question you have. And he does it, even though he knows people are not for him. Such is the love and the mercy of our Lord 
and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now look, I'm just giving you this talk because there's important lessons to learn. And when you learn about this chapter, I want you to be careful then, first of all. When someone says to you, what would Jesus do? I know what Jesus would do, but I'm not Jesus, okay? I'm not Jesus. And uh, there is an opportunity, and perhaps you should take it. You're going to have to be extremely careful. But what it does teach us is this. Not what would Jesus do, but what we're really like what we're really like as, as human beings in our fallen nature, in our character, how sick religion really is, how the human spirit is twisted and spiteful and the human spirit has no balance or gravitas on what's before us and the situation that all they can do is when Jesus Christ was there and watched him closely. Remember now, it's a setup. Verse 2, and behold, there was a man of the dropsy uh, who, who was there before him. That's what uh, people are like. Let me bring it home to you. And uh, we need to watch it because this spirit is in all of us. Have, have you ever been and it, it happens, I'm afraid it has happened, that you could go to a meeting such like this, this morning, or go to a meeting on a Sunday. I remember someone telling me years ago that when you're talking years ago now, you're talking, say, 50 years ago, they went and they were the preacher in the, in the, in the chapel. And he said to me that on that Sunday, I remember years ago, people were very posh years ago, you dressed up, did you not, to go to chapel? Well, the man dressed up as he would. He was in the pulpit. He had his suit. He had his tie. He had everything on. But there was one thing he didn't have on. His shoes were brown and not black. Well, as someone said, they may as well have been orange. And uh, you, then you see, what happens is this, that all of a sudden, I'm not saying how it went, let's just surmise, that here's the man preaching the gospel, telling the love of God, save sinners, risen again from the dead. You know your sins forgiven. He can come to you. Did you see him? He had brown shoes on. Brown shoes. Can't listen to a word that man says. Have you not been to a, a place of worship where all of a sudden they, they sing? I know it may be terrible. They sing some chorus. Chorus, a chorus they sang. And yet, in that very place, people's lives are being touched. People are being ministered to. Jesus Christ is being found. It was shocking. And you know what we did? We sang that chorus twice, and perhaps even three times. And all of a sudden, you see, there's that attitude which is in us. And I'll tell you something else. Ministers are worse than anyone else. That when you see they have to listen uh, to another minister, always looking for that fault, uh, looking for perhaps, you know, the wrong reference. Did you see that? He gave the wrong reference. What a... How can you trust it? It was verse something. It wasn't that verse. And because of that, everything's lost. I didn't like that illustration. I didn't like what he said there. And before you know it, you have lost the gospel and all then that it is for. And so it is, you see, that's what we're mindful here. It is highlighting this perverse nature which is totally out of sync. And here's now in verse 3, I just want to bring it uh, to you. Uh, the gospel for these people is all do's and don'ts. And now in verse 3, here's the question. And this is why we believe that it could be a setup. Remember, they've just watched him. The man's placed there with the dropsy. 
And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, now that was the big thing. Now, remember again, there was this uh, terrible incident which took place in Mark chapter 3. And what happened was this, is that he was in the synagogue on the Sabbath uh, so that they might accuse him. They watched him closely. Again, verse 3. It's an awful thing. If you want to know what it's like to be a preacher, it's, it's terrible. People watching your every step, your every word, your every movement, your every dress. And here it is now, on the Sabbath, they might accuse him. And then in verse 4 of chapter 3, verse Mark, is it uh, lawful to evil to save life or to kill? They kept silent. Anyway, he heals them, and from that moment they went to kill him. Now, I'm just going to highlight this for you today. I want you to think upon this now for a moment. He asks them the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? I'm going to ask you that question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, we in Wales, as you know, have been brought up with a culture which was perhaps more so than even in Europe, of the Sabbatarian culture. I mean, when you were thinking of Wales, you know of the things you weren't allowed to do. I think it killed people in the end, you know. Now, just remember now, full of don'ts. Don't play ball on the Sabbath. Not out in the street to play. No washing on the washing line on a Sabbath. No cooking food as much as you could on the Sabbath. Definitely no shopping on the Sabbath. And in the time, even when I was a child, there was no drinking on the Sabbath. The towns were dry, dry towns, where pubs and clubs were closed on the Sabbath. No rugby on the Sabbath. No football on the Sabbath. No DIY shops, nothing. It was a very strange time. But with all the nothingness, what could you do on the Sabbath? Well, is it not right to heal on the Sabbath? Now, I'm going to change this right round because there are those now who will be listening to this message and they'll be saying something like this to, to this church, saying something like this to gospel ministry like me. Do you know the problem you've got in Bethesda? I'll tell you the problem you've got. You people are those Sabbatarians. All right, okay. Why is that? You've got two services on a Sunday. Two services on a Sunday. Well, I've got something to ask you. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Is it not lawful that the gospel go out on the Sabbath? Is it not lawful that sins will be forgiven on the Sabbath? Is it not lawful for the power of God to be known on the Sabbath? Is it not lawful that Jesus Christ would come to us on the Sabbath? Think of that. And with all their freedoms and all their liberties and all they've got that we're so relaxed and we keep then no law. We keep no day. We are more relaxed and we know these things have passed. Fair enough. I'm just asking you one question. You tell me what can heal this land. You tell me what can heal sinful souls. People who are caught in addiction. I tell you what, it's only Jesus Christ. And before you've got all your super spiritual liberalism and liberality to the things of God, well, I think, I'll answer that question to you. I think it's lawful that this word would go out. And uh, God's blessed that Sabbath. He blessed it with his presence, came to his disciples. He revealed himself to those in need. He saved. It was a special day. On that Sabbath, he did the great work, did he not? Yes, the work we're talking about now, the one we keep. He rose again from the dead. Yeah, I want to praise God on that day. <laughs> it's a good day. It's the first day of the week and I'm happy with it. And so it is. 
And so you see, you answer that uh, question. Now look now, something else. And here it is. And here it is now. So he asks the question. And um, verse 4. But they kept silent. And he took him. And healed him. And let him go. Now this reveals something more. Every miracle reveals something about the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the way that he conducts his miracles always teaches us something. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ did his miracles different, didn't he? Sometimes he just spoke a word. Sometimes he never even, I think, spoke a word. Uh, sometimes he made clay. Sometimes he touched people. Sometimes he, he, you know, put his fingers in people's ears and he spat and he did all these miracles in a different way to show and to reveal something about himself. Let me tell you what this miracle shows us. Here's this man standing in the house of the Pharisees. And it says, first of all, and he took him, took him. Number one point. Religion will never take you. If you're a sinner and you're diseased and you're polluted, I know this, that religion will never embrace you in any shape or any form. Do you know what religion is? Religion is for those which are perfect and right. Uh, the places of our worship are for those whose lives are all worked out. And to have a creature like this in front of us, a man who's got dropsy, whose whole body is out proportion, who's filled with fluid, who looks obnoxious and has no place because they believe that a man such as that has the judgment of God upon them and a man like that must not be in the favour of God. Religion will never do it. Remember that. You can walk into any religious place of worship and they will never embrace you and put their arms around you. That's what happens in religious places. But Jesus Christ did something. In the midst of them all, he took him. And I will say to you today, the Lord Jesus Christ will take you. You stand before you, him and in his mercy and in his compassion and in his great love as he sees you standing there as some kind of sight to, to be watched and to be ridiculed. The Lord Jesus Christ can do it. He will take you to himself. And you know what else he'll do? He will heal you. Religion will never heal you. Only Jesus Christ. Religion is impotent. Religion has no power, no love, no compassion. But Jesus, you see, I mean, don't get me wrong, there may be those who may have compassion on such people. They've got no power. But Jesus Christ can do that. Do you know, he can heal people. This place where the gospel goes out, can heal people of their addictions and of their sins and of their lives and of the, the, the things that, that, that they have need of in body and soul and mind. Jesus Christ can heal. You say, okay, it reveals something. Here's something else, and don't miss it, because this is new. And let him... Go. Here's a difference. I tell you what religion will do. It won't take you. It won't help you. But it won't let you go. And you're like a man in this house. Caught in bondage. Caught now in this place and imprisoned. And always be mindful of that. What is truly of God and the gospel and what is false. And one of the differences is this. 
is that Jesus Christ, when he comes and takes a person to himself, when Jesus Christ comes and heals a person, Jesus Christ, you know what he will do? He will release you and free you and let you go. That's different. Different. This is how it works. Be very careful. Every single cult in this world, a cult, this is what a cult will do. And you say, how do I know it's a cult? Well, here's one thing. A cult will take you, that's for sure. A cult won't heal you. But a cult will never leave you go. A cult will take you. A cult will add a manner of rules upon you. What you do, what you don't do, the things you need to do. And once you're part of them, there's one thing you can't do. You can't leave. They've got you. It doesn't work like that with Jesus. I know some people are fearful. Just put it into your thinking now about Jesus, how he deals with people. Some people think, if I become a Christian, I'm going to be part of this group. Yes, you're going to be part of a church, that's for sure. But I become a Christian. You feel, will I be entrapped and the bondage and all the things which are expected. This is how Jesus deals with us. He deals with us with an utter, absolute freedom that we can have. He does it like this. In this church, you may not uh, like some of the things which are allowed or not allowed, but what we believe is this, is an evangelical obedience. Do you know what an evangelical obedience is? It's an obedience which is worked out from the freedom of one's heart. That's it. That's it. So if you're here this morning, you're here because you want to be here. That's how it works. We haven't got a whip on our hands. You know, cracking it to be... And when people come in, and then they take Jesus, and Jesus touches them, do you know what else happens? Jesus then... We don't hold on to them. They then may go other places. They have the freedom to do so. There's a work for them to be done. Things they need to do. They go. You realise that. One of the things you must realise in ministry is that you help people at a certain moment knowing that they're going to move on because you've helped them. You've given them the help and you think, that's fine. They've gone. No, it doesn't work like that. You help them knowing that there's the freedom for them to live their lives as God wants them to live. That is the gospel. And it's utterly different to what this world has got. Now, don't get me wrong. There is an evangelical obedience. That means you say he was free. Well, I'll tell you, if you've been healed of Jesus, you're going to be free to serve him, aren't you? That's what you're going to do. That's what's going to happen. And you're going to be free to love him. And you'll never forget it. And in the midst of all this, he let him go. Now look now, something else here. Oh look, time's going, but we're going to get there. Verse then five. Second time, then he answered them saying, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. Now, the next thing, the second question, remember now in verse 4, uh, he asked them the question, uh, is it lawful? They kept silent. Verse 6, they could answer him regarding these things. Now, here's the question. Is it more lawful uh, to uh, heal on the Sabbath? Second question, which of you having a donkey or an ox falls into the pit. Now, here's the problem. Now, please look at this. There's one of your animals which are in the pit on the Sabbath. And the question was a real question because this is how they used to answer it. Well, if you think that the ox or the donkey is going to last till the next day, well, just hang on and just do it on, a, you know, on the next day. And, and uh, you know, there would be those who would do that. 
and even when it came to illnesses. If you thought that someone was going to live to the next day, well, leave them there. Don't actually, you know, perform your medicine till the next day. Remember, if this man was in a &E, he'd definitely be left to the next day. But Jesus has got a new heart and there's something different in it. And here's the heart. He's got a heart, you see, for people, for men and women. But you must watch it. Just give you this example, sad as it is, there are ministers this day that won't preach the gospel that will heal people and save people because of the church that they're now going to preach in is not of the same denomination or perhaps because they've got a different policy, listen to it, on church government. I'm thinking to myself, hang on. Hold your horses for a moment. You're telling me that you won't give the water of life, you won't give the healing balm, you won't give the saving news because they believe in some different form of church government. People are dying. People are going to hell. People are lost. There are people who won't go and preach because... There's a different version of the Bible. Are you serious? You mean, you're the one who's got the light. You're the one who's got the news. Who else will do it? God has called you. I won't go and preach to those people because they've got that hymn book. Are you lost? If any of you, Listen, for these rules and regulations and mindset, the gospel is in conflict with all of this. And so it is, here is then verse 6, where it tells us, and they could not answer him regarding these things. The first time they were silent is because they did not want to speak. The second time they were silent is because they could not speak. Now, here's something of the gospel to us. You need to realize that when the gospel comes, every single mouth will be stopped. And whatever you're thinking, whatever you're believing, you need to be very careful with your traditions and rituals and ideas that somehow you can be justified before God because this is what it says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. For we know that wherever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the flesh, no flesh will be justified by the deeds of the law. No flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And there's a day coming. This is the gospel, gospel sight of what will happen one day. And all the religious, with all their practices, all their ideas, which have bypassed the love of men, the needs of others on that day every mouth will be stopped no one will have an answer to this glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ powerful stuff isn't it just one little dinner party where the Lord teaches the gospel of good news now